It is good to be with you. God bless you this morning uh, for allowing me to be here. I invite you to open in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you're kind of new to church stuff, if this isn't something that in, in the past you've normally done and you're going, oh my gosh, I don't know where 1 Samuel is at, then I invite you to grab the Bible that's in front of you somewhere uh, in the Bible holder and just turn to page 174. That's where I'm going to be this morning. Now, if you brought your own, I have no idea what page it's on. You'll have to figure that one out for yourself, but it is certainly good to be here. I love uh, Josh very much and Sarah and his, their whole family. It's good to worship with them again and serve with them. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I, I wonder this morning if you and I have more in common uh, than, than we know, because when I was first walking with the Lord, when Jesus first saved me, and I was just learning how to study the Bible and falling in love with the Word of God, I would read in the Old Testament where when God wanted to say something to somebody, he would just send an angel, like this awesome, amazing angel, and the angel would show up, and the human being would go, oh my gosh, and the angel would say, don't worry, I'm not here to harm you, I have a message from the Lord, and then they would deliver the message, and I remember as a young unbeliever thinking to myself, man, God, I'm really, I'm really wanting you to, to talk to me that way. You know, I've got this relationship that I need guidance on, or I've got this future that I'm worried about, and I just need you to drop an angel like you did in the Old Testament and just be so clear with me. Now, if you're a, a theologian, I want to pause, and I want to say, I know that anytime we want to hear God speak, we just open his word, Amen. We know that this is the word of God, and this morning, if you're hungry to hear God speak to you, all you have to do is open and read. I understand that, but also, sometimes in life, we've got this decision going on, or we've got this circumstance that we're facing, or we've got this relationship thing going on, and we're searching the scripture, and we're looking for the answer, but we're just thinking to ourselves, God, would you just do it the way you did it in the Old Testament? And then I read this scripture, and I realize that even in the Old Testament, way back in the, in the old days, there still was a lot of discernment that the people of God had to go through to understand that it was God speaking and what exactly God was saying to them. This is a story this morning about a guy by the name of Samuel who grows up in the temple, literally grows up in the temple. And one evening, God speaks to him and he doesn't know it's God. And so he jumps up and he runs to his mentor, whose name is Eli. We'll see that in just a moment. He's like, hey, Eli, I'm here. Why are you calling me? And Eli's like, you're crazy. I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And so it happens again. God calls Samuel. Samuel jumps up, runs to Eli. Eli says, I'm not calling you. Go back to sleep. This happens three times. We'll read this in just a moment. Finally, Eli goes, oh, I know what's going on. God's calling him. So he gives him some instructions on what to do. Look at that with me, if you would, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 3. The boy Samuel, starting in verse 1, the boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and prophetic visions were not very widespread. So one day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his room, before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was located. And then the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. I did not call, Eli replied, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Verse six, once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. I did not call my son. He replied, go back and lie down. Now Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, he went to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. And then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. 
Now, before we look at Samuel's response, I just would love, if, if you're the type that marks things in your Bible, I just would love for you to mark verse 10. I want you to feel the nearness of God to Samuel's life. The Lord came and stood where Samuel was and called him by his name twice. Isn't that beautiful? He called out Samuel, Samuel. He was standing there in his room. Samuel responded, we're in verse 10, speak for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do something in Israel that everyone who hears about it will shudder. On that day, I will carry out against Eli everything I said about his family. From beginning to end, I told him that I'm going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he knows about. His sons are defiling the sanctuary and he has not stopped them. Therefore, I have sworn to Eli's family the iniquity of Eli's family will never be wiped out either by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay down until the morning and then he opened the doors of the Lord's house. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Can you feel the tension here? <laughs> here Samuel was gun running to Eli over and over in the middle of the night, right? And, and Eli finally figures it out and he says, Samuel, go lay down and listen. If you hear this again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Eli is helping Samuel understand that it is God who's talking. And so Samuel does that. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then the message is a message of rebuke and judgment against his mentor, Eli. Can you imagine going to bed that night going, oh, what am I gonna tell Eli in the morning? Can you imagine that? And then the next day wakes up and Samuel's starting to do the things that he's gonna do and Eli calls for him and you can just almost feel his heart sink into the middle of his stomach, right? I have to tell this guy. So Eli says, hey, I want you to tell me, verse 17, what was the message that God gave you? Don't hide it from me. And may God punish you and do it severely if you hide anything from me that he told you. And so then Samuel told him everything and he did not hide anything from him. And Eli responded, he is the Lord. He will do what he thinks is good. Lord, now as we think about this text of scripture and as we seek to understand how to discern your voice, I pray that you would bless our minds, our ears, our hearts to receive deeply the truth of God's word. In this very moment, Lord, we pray your blessing over Pastor James and Carrie as they rest. We thank you for their ministry. We pray that wherever they are at this very moment that they would feel the tremendous love that you have for them and that this church has for them. Bless them, Lord, now as we study the scripture, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, if you're a note taker, I wanna give you four principles for helping to discern the voice of God. This presumes you're interested in discerning the voice of God. Uh, I presume that you are a person uh, who longs to know when and what God is saying to you. Now, I can't supply that motive, but if you have that motive, if you have that desire, if you were to open your heart and inside of you, there's this heart pumping to be near to God and to hear God when he speaks to you, I have four thoughts for you. And the first one is this, like Samuel, we need to understand that being near the things of God doesn't necessarily mean that we know God. This is an important caution for us. I'm so passionate about this because this is my life story. Like when I read Samuel, that he grew up near the things of God, but he did not know God because God had not yet revealed himself. He didn't know the voice of God, although he was around the things of God. That is my story to a T. I spent, I wasted years thinking that I was close to God and I really wasn't. I thought because I went to church on Sundays and listened to the Sunday school teacher, because I could sing all of the songs, I didn't even have to look at the screen or look at the hymnal, I knew them all by heart. I knew all the gospel stories. If you asked me what the gospel story was, I could tell you that Jesus died for my sin and he resurrected on the third day. I knew all this stuff, but I'd not yielded my life to Christ. I was around the things of God 
but I didn't know God. And when I read this text, I say, I, I identify with Samuel. He literally grew up in the house of God, but he didn't know the Lord. Now that might be where you're at today. Now if you're here today as a guest, this is the first time you've been to church in years, we're so glad that you're here. You and I have something in common. We're both guests today. But I wanna say this to you. Being in this building doesn't make you right with God. Receiving the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior is what connects you to God in a life-giving way. And I find it interesting that this is a story about Samuel struggling to discern God's voice and this profound statement, now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. I just find that helpful for me so that we understand that some Sometimes we're so religious or we're so spiritual or we're so much around the things of God, but we don't stop to realize that just being in proximity doesn't necessarily mean that we're walking with God or that we have peace with God. And so the first thought this morning is understanding that like Samuel, being near the things of God doesn't mean that you know God. Now this morning, if that hits you like a ton of bricks, and some alarms start going off inside of you, and you go, oh my goodness, that's me, that's talking about me, then I urge you to find one of your pastors, find one of your leaders here at the church, and share that truth with them, and say, I need you to talk to me about this, because I've been around the things of God, but I don't know God, and I need assistance on knowing how to give my life to Christ, so that I can know God, and so that I can have peace with God. The second thought that I share with you this morning is that understand, just like Samuel, the struggle of discernment is not sinful. Now, some of us in this room are harder on ourselves than others. Some of us in this room have this really toxic self-speak that we speak to ourselves, either when things aren't going our way, or we're confused, or we're tired, or we're angry, or we're disappointed. And one of the things that I think is important for you and I to be cognizant of, as we hunger to really understand what it is that God would say to us, as we seek to honor God in our homes and with our lives and at our jobs, and we say, oh Lord, would you speak to me? And then we don't hear God saying anything to us. It's important for you to understand that doesn't mean that God disproves of you. It doesn't mean that God is angry at you. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily living in sin. In fact, nowhere in the text does it say that Samuel was living in sin, which is why he couldn't understand what God was saying. Nowhere in the text does it say that God was angry at Samuel for not understanding. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But the struggle of discernment is not sinful. So if you're here today, you're going through a season of life and you've been praying and you've been in the word of God and you're really seeking God's guidance and you haven't heard it or you haven't discerned it yet, and you might start thinking, I, I guess God is just disappointed in me. I guess God doesn't love me. I guess I'm second uh, to God. I'm not that important. Everybody else is more important. Don't let that set in. Don't, don't begin to believe that. The third thought that I want to share with you this morning is that understanding just like Samuel, sometimes we need help. Now, I will tell you that was the hardest one for me to write because I don't like to ask for help. I don't like to be a person that needs help. But isn't it true that Samuel needed help? Here's a young man growing up to serve the Lord. God is speaking to him. God is literally in his room, standing above him, calling out his name, and he can't figure it out, and he needs help. And so he gets help. He has this incredible mentor. And if, there, this, if this sermon was anything else, it would be a sermon about the infinite importance of having godly mentors in our lives. Because here's Eli. And what does Eli do? What does a good mentor do? Pushes you back to the Lord. He can't figure it out. He needed help. But eventually Eli figures it out and he says, oh, I know. Isn't it interesting that Eli understood what was going on before Samuel? And it was Samuel's message. But he pushed him back to the Lord. He said, listen, when you hear this voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. 
If you're here today and you don't have a mentor, you don't have somebody who's discipling you, helping you to follow the commands of Jesus, find you someone that will push you back to God and say, run into the presence of God and say, here I am, Lord, and I'm listening. Find you a person with the character of that last verse that we looked at. Find you a person that in verse 18, even when God speaks against Eli, Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what he wants. Find that kind of mentor. He needed help. And it's okay to need help. Because we have human brains, don't we? And sometimes when God is doing God-sized stuff, and I'm trying to process process that in a Zach-sized brain, it does not work out. And I need mentors in my life that pray through with me. I need mentors in my life to point me back to the scripture. I need mentors in my life to say, hey, have you just said to God, speak, Lord, because your servant is listening? That's the type of mentors that we need. Now, uh, the forethought that I, I share with you as we think about learning to understand the voice of God Like Samuel, we must find the voice of radical yieldedness. And I know that in today's world, the the term radical kind of has this negative connotation. I get that. I don't mean it negative. In fact, I mean it in the most positive of ways. Here's Samuel, young kid. Hasn't really met the Lord yet. Hasn't done a ton of ministry yet. He's going to, but he hasn't yet. And he figures out, oh, God's talking to me. And he takes his mentor's advice. And in the quietness, quietness of his own room, between him and God, he prays one of the most glorious powerful, meaningful prayers a person could ever speak. He says, speak, for your servant is listening. Radical yieldedness. What if in every Christian home in this city, that was the prayer that dominated the house? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. What if every politician who claimed to know Christ went into session and before they started voting or talking about yes or no, whatever it is, what if the first thing they did is they said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What if that was the prayer that we prayed over and over and over? Radical yield. The reason I believe this is such an amazing prayer is it is the perfect marriage between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. What I mean by orthodoxy is correct thinking or correct belief. Orthopraxy is correct action or doing. And he says, and this is a boy, he's teaching us how to pray this young kid. He says, speak. For your servant, orthodoxy. I am a servant to God most high. Orthodoxy is listening. Now that word means to listen with the intent to obey. His orthodoxy and his orthopraxy, his thinking and his doing is lined up. Lord, speak because I am ready to do whatever it is that you want me to do. It is an open-ended yes. It is a hearty amen before you ever even speak to me. I think this is the prayer that we need to adopt over and over and over again. In our homes, at these altars, in the churches, everywhere. This is the prayer, radical yieldedness. Now, if you're here today and this is new for you, you haven't been in church very long, very often. Again, I say to you, we're glad that you're here. One of the reasons that I'm glad you're here today is because I want to, here at the end of this message, spend a few moments talking 
about what this scripture teaches us about the character of God. Now, we've looked at the story a little bit, and we have taken from the story some principles that will help us in life. We need help, we need mentors, right? We need to not feel defeated if we're not hearing God speak because discernment process in that struggle doesn't mean that we're sinful. So we've learned some of these things, but I want to hold out for you some characteristics of God that I think are beautiful. Three characteristics about God from this scripture. The first is that God is a God who communicates. Said differently, God is communicative, which means God actively, intentionally, and on purpose speaks to human beings. If you were to go through scripture, you would see at every season of life in the people of God, God has been faithful to speak. God spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. God spoke through angels. God spoke through prophets. God spoke, Hebrews chapter one, verse one says, in the past at many times and in various ways, God spoke to his people. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Now we have the word of God. God continues to communicate. And so sometimes we fall into this misunderstanding of who God is, that God is this far away being that locks himself in a room and and he won't be seen and he won't be heard by anybody. And the best we can do is just wing it or guess. That's not our God. God is committed to communicating with us. And I want you to feel secure in knowing that your God doesn't give you the silent treatment. The second thing that we learn about God is that God is patient. Now I'd be embarrassed to have my story written here underneath Samuel's because I would have to say there's probably been times in my life where it's been more than three times or four times that it took me to figure out that God is trying to tell me something important. Now, maybe that's not true for you, but it certainly is true for me. But I want you to see ringingly clear the patience of God. God is in his room calling his name and Samuel doesn't get it. Goes back to sleep, calls him again. Wakes up, runs to Eli. He doesn't get it. Patience, 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 patience. God is patient with us. That doesn't mean he excuses sin. It doesn't mean that he approves of sin. But here we're not talking about sin. We're talking about a human being that is trying to latch on to the word of God and just doesn't get it yet. God is patient with him. Would you rest in that today? Would you find the ability to just exhale and just say, thank you, Lord, for your patience when I didn't get it, when I misunderstood what you were doing, when I didn't hear the voice of God like I wanted to hear it, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Lord, I'm so thankful that my faithfulness isn't what holds this whole thing together, but your faithfulness is what holds this whole thing together. God is a God who communicates and God is a God who is patient and God is a God who is clear. And it's kind of funny to say that in a text like this where if it, Samuel's not clear at all, right? In fact, it takes him four times. And say, like, what do you mean God is clear? This is a story about something being unclear. Well, the unclearedness, is that a word? The unclearness <laughs> is with Samuel, not with God. God was so clear with him, calling his name, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And then, even uncomfortably clear was God's message to Samuel. Samuel, here's my message to you. Your mentor who raised you up, that you love deeply, he's under judgment. You're going to be the one to deliver that news. God was clear. Samuel wasn't. But again, it depends on God's faithfulness and God's clarity, not ours. The reason I want to end with that today is because I think it's important for you to have established this truth. It is not the will of God 
that any person here this morning or watching this back at some point, it is not God's will for any person to be confused on where they stand with God. If there's any confusion on where we stand with God, it is on our part, not on God's part. So this morning I would say to you that as we close and you think to yourself, do I know where I stand with the Lord? Do I know where I stand with God? If the answer is no, I encourage you to hang around the service after we close and talk with some of the pastors, talk with some of your church leaders and say, help me figure this out because I really do want to know where I stand with God. I really, I really do want to be near to the Lord. I want to ask you.